Appeals Division One is now in session. Thank you. Be seated. Morning. Now is the time set for oral argument in cause number one CA CV eighteen zero zero two seven. American Federation of State, Count, County, and Municipal Employees versus the City of Phoenix. Uh, for everybody's information, and it's uh, been being done for too long to be a surprise now, we're going to be uh, audio and video recording these proceedings, so barring any unforeseen circumstances, both audio and video should be available to you for your review on YouTube in the next couple of weeks. Council, each side will be entitled to 20 minutes. We would ask that you respect the time period. The timer on the podium will let you know how much time you have left. An appellant, if you wish to reserve any of your time for rebuttal, keep it in mind. It's up to you to preserve it. All right. We've reviewed the briefs and conferenced the case this morning, so we are well aware of the facts and issues attendant to the argument. You might want to keep that in mind in figuring out how you want to configure your, your argument today. And counsel, when you come to the podium, I would ask that you state your name so we've got it on the record and who you represent. And with that, counsel for the appellant, you may begin. Good morning, Your Honors. If it pleases the court, my name is Susan Martin, and with me at counsel table are Jennifer Kroll and Michael Licata, and we're here to represent the plaintiff's appellants in this matter. Uh, Your Honors, uh, it's our position that to uphold the lower court's decision in this court, would the, the court would have to find that COPERS both unambiguously excludes payments for accrued vacation from the pension benefit calculation and that the city's more than three decades of promises to its employees can, uh, are meaningless and that they can simply walk away from them. We respectfully submit that the court can't make either of those findings for five very important reasons that I'll just briefly review. First, it's our position that COPER's definitions unambiguously include payment for accrued vacation uh, in the calculation of pensions. Uh, second, even if the court were to find that the newfound definition uh, were reasonable and therefore that this, uh, it would have to find that the charter was ambiguous. Once finding that the charter was ambiguous, the court would look to the uninterrupted, decades long established and agreed meaning of the provisions that, and, and unless it found those to be manifestly un erroneous, it would have to find in favor of the plaintiffs. Next, Yazelle. Uh, Yazelle says that, um, pension rights vest on the first day of employment and that these rights are contractual in nature. To determine the meaning of the charter here, you would look and apply contract principles and the restatement of contracts is very clear. It says that where the parties give us prescribed meaning to a word or term, that is the meaning that controls even if the court were to have a different conclusion. So applying Giselle principles in contract law, we would say that the established meaning of including accrued vacation pay in the calculation of benefits uh, is required. That would give vast uh, administrative. That would give vast administrative discretion then to to completely reform pension plans with no. Um, legal intervention at all, right? I mean, if, if a plan administrator said, uh, your expense reimbursements are now going to count, um, and said that for, for a few years, then, then we would just be bound by that? I think you would be bound by that unless you were to find, again, that it was manifestly inappropriate or unreasonable, which is the same standard you'd apply in, in evaluating an ambiguous uh, an ambiguous contract. I think there are this those who might say, though, that that being paid forever for not taking a day's vacation is manifestly inappropriate. 
right? Because it, because that's not uh, that that is essentially augmenting compensation beyond the, the terms of the original contract. Well, Your Honor, but looking at the definitions, there are those who would say that getting a raise in the last year of your employment, uh, which would forever raise your pension, would also be inappropriate. The words do not contain a limitation or the limitation imposed by the lower court. The words salary and wages, as defined in the definition of compensation, are clearly broad enough to encompass the payments here at issue. It would have been a simple thing, and it still is a simple thing, if the city is is dissatisfied with the actual definitions in the charter, it can simply go to the voters as it has about a dozen times and ask for the, the charter to be reformed with respect to future employees. It can't do it with respect to current ones. Here... So isn't the inverse true? There was a statute, ARS, but from 1970 to 1984 that expressly uh, included, I think it was irregular payments or compensatory remuneration uh, in that pension calculus. So doesn't the inverse argument work against you just as powerfully that the, the, the city didn't do what was right there in front of its very eyes? It just had to look at ARS to see what definition uh, would, would get the city at least where it wants to go today. Well, the ARS was expressly amended in 1984. Right, I'm talking about b before. Right, right, but the Attorney General of the State of Arizona uh, stated that prior to the express amendments of those statutes, there was no exclusion for, uh, for payments at termination of employment. That, right, so, so, so what I'm saying is that almost served, it exemplified, uh, it was an instruction guide, if you will, to, to, to the, uh, the city here um, or, you know, to, to, to include, uh, or I guess, the, the unions or, or the employees, such language, irregular payments, compensatory remuneration in the charter or the plan, or at least put it to the voter, uh, and that, that never happened. No, Your Honor, I think the, the converse is correct. In the absence of an express exclusion, the words salary and wages should be given their common, uh, widely understood usage, which there's no doubt here that in 1953, when uh, COPERS was adopted, the dictionary definitions were clearly broad enough to include these terms. If on notice now what ASRS did or what the state did with respect to ASRS, uh, providing a whole list of specific exclusions. If the city wanted those exclusions, it should have adopted similar, similar exclusions, but it didn't. It continued to have these very broad definitions, which include, by the way, all kinds of categories of uh, non-regular, perhaps single payment uh, compensation that there's no dispute here are, are continue to be included in the calculation for pension benefits. The formula includes, for example, overtime. It includes the annual payment of vacation sellback, which is completely indistinguishable from the vacation paid payments here. Every year, twice a year, if employees qualify, they can cash in up to 80 hours of their unused vacation pay. And if those cash-ins are done within the highest three years of employment, of compensation, those cash-ins are included in the calculation of pension benefits. So hypothetically then, if, if an administrator said, there's no time limit on this, you've been working here for 30 years, let's go back and look at, at all the vacation you missed 30 years ago, and we'll add all that up. Um, and you can cash all that in and add it to your final compensation, that would be okay. Required. Uh, saying required. I'm, I'm saying if, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that, that the administration of this pension statute conforms with the letter of the law. Well, let's well, talk but about I asked you a question. I asked you a question, and I, I, don't, I don't think you've answered it. I'm saying that if, I'm saying that if, if the city determined to uh, to pay all accrued vacation? I have no limit. I mean, on your last day, you could look back and say, you know, that day in 1989, I didn't take I, I didn't take vacation. 
um, all of that could add up to quite a substantial sum. Uh, and and you're saying that the under current law, uh, if the administrator simply decides to expand the, the look back, that that's mandatory to include that. I th I believe it is, Your Honor. I and don't the think the policy has discretion. You no. believe well to decide this, exactly how long to, to, to do that. I mean, that city, seems a standardless. Pension. I think the d situation you described was the situation that applied to the city managers, uh, which prompted the media inquiry and uproar uh, over so-called pension spiking. But the fact is, the city has policies for payment of vacation pay. If it had a policy that was unlimited, that would be included under COPERS. It's not the court's province to decide whether the policy is a good one or a bad one. No, it's the court's province to interpret the language of the law and the language of the law, I, I would assume, would be uh, calculated to allow rational management of a pension fund. How is an actuary to, to uh, calculate the health of the fund if an administrator can at any time make drastic changes in, in benefits without a change in the law? Well, that's precisely the problem that, that arose by the defendant's conduct, Your Honor, because in this case, all of the vacation payments were analyzed and included by the actuary in determining the contribution allocations and the actuarial uh, determinations in, that were included in certifications to the city. The actuaries estimated and determined how much the payment of accrued vacation at termination would cost. That was consistently included in their in their actuarial valuations that were certified to the city. But you're saying that today uh, the city could just decide to have an infinite look back. Excuse me? You're saying that today the city has the unqualified right to say, you know, we're not going to look back two years, three years, we're going to look back 25. I think the response to that would be yes, and if the electorate were dissatisfied with that, they could show that by replacing the people who are making those decisions. Please. That's the province of, of, of the electorate determining who their leadership is. That's not a province of a court to correct because the policies of the city are, the, are for the, the city to decide. So I certainly agree with you that the province of the court to, to examine its own preferences as to these policies uh, should be limited or nil. But you suggested earlier that in this argument that if the administrator did something manifestly unreasonable that the court could intervene. Where's the standard? Well, because under the, under the statutes that under Long v. Dick and under statutes that the court finds that this charter is, an, is ambiguous, it will look to the uh, practice of the parties and will apply the meaning given unless it finds that it's but, manifestly. But I, gave you, I gave you an absurd hypothetical where, where the administrator says all of your expense reimbursements now count as compensation because it's a check we write you. So that'll, that'll count towards your compensation. I think you, you acknowledge that that would be manifestly unreasonable, right? I think it might be manifestly unreasonable. And, and, and that a court could intervene then. If the court found that the practice was was out of line with the words of the charter, it could. But if the words of the charter were broad enough to encompass the extreme example Your Honor poses, I don't think the, the, it would be the province of the court to correct it. I think it's the province of the legislature, in this case uh, through referendum or initiative, to correct that or through replacing the people who established those policies in the first place. So whenever you have an inconsistent chart, you want to go ahead? Um, if you have an, would you concede that a charter, at least under Arizona law, is, is akin to a constitution? Well, yeah, well, it is the laws governing the, the city of Phoenix. Right. Yeah. And does Arizona law call it something akin to a constitution? I believe it does. Okay. And so you're telling the court, you're saying anytime the constitution is ambiguous, uh, we're going to look to the uh, municipal administrators to, to interpret what it means. So let's look at all the provisions in the U.S. and Arizona Constitution, whether it be substantive due process, uh, which, which doesn't have a, a crystal clear meaning. Under your uh, 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 argument, uh, any time uh, the, the language doesn't uh, scream with clarity, uh, we, we look to 
an administrator to determine well, uh, and to interpret uh, the words of, of a founding document. No, Your Honor, I don't think that's the exclusive ca uh, factor that the court would consider. The courts consider uh, when statutes are ambiguous or constitutions are ambiguous, the context, the history, the purpose, the spirit, all of those factors. And in this case, all of those factors mitigate, militate in favor of the plaintiffs. For example, uh, the... Right, right but, but the point you're... Right, you, so I understand you're saying... It, it's not crystal clear, so let's look elsewhere. But when we look elsewhere, you're saying to look to a particular place. I'm and saying that is how the, the, the city administrators. That's one place, Your Honor, but the other places also favor the plaintiffs. For example, the context here. Uh, the ruling of the court below cannot be squared with the actual words of the statute. Finding in the word annual compensation a requirement that compensation must be paid with regularity or it doesn't get included in final average compensation conflicts with the statute. First, the definition of compensation is in the, pre, the section 2.13, which says compensation is salary and wages for, for personal services performed. To, to ascribe to an adjective that's, in, that's, that's placed to designate a time frame, uh, the words that restrict the type of payment is inconsistent with the structure of the statute. The very next sentence of section 2.14, which is the final average compensation provision that the court relied on, uh, says no such thing. It doesn't include annual compensation. It Let's says talk if you about have that. Well, Excuse you, me? You, your colleague says it's, um, I think they use the word obviously imputed. Right, but exclusions are in to be imputed. Exclusions are to be interpreted narrowly, and in a pension statute's ambiguity should be resolved in favor of the participants. I would like to reserve some time for rebuttal. I see I that. I, I understand, but but I'd like to follow up on one thing because, uh, on the one hand, you're saying the plaintiffs don't need to rely on this administrative discretion, but on the other hand, you're saying uh, it exists. And presumably, then, if if an administrator does something um, that even something unreasonable, uh, your Yazel argument would say, well, that's baked in now, right? I am unfamiliar with any Arizona case that contains this administrative discretion. I'm not referring, Your Honor, solely to the administrator. We're talking about the city itself and the and the and the electorate, for that matter. We're all on notice. The electorate is a very different well, uh, being everyone that has was, the capacity to make law. They didn't hear. But but the city council brought uh, a, a half a dozen, if not more, amendments to the voters. While this practice was was publicized and now and, and embedded and established, the, the and there didn't. The and voters didn't, weren't asked to pass on this policy. The, the voters, in fact, did pass on this policy and rejected it in a 2014 initiative that would have restricted uh, final average pay to base pay. That initiative, which is in our papers, was was resoundingly defeated. Um, but that's that's sort of different than what I said. Right? Well, <laughs> but when you go to the electorate with these issues in mind, and we're, by the way, with a task force that recommended that these changes be made prospectively for future employees, not current employees, then you have, you know, you have the entire city saying uh, that we know about this and we're just going to violate these rights because we, we know we can't get it passed through a, an amendment. If, if an uh, in your view, if an administrator says, for those employees who don't accept health benefits, uh, we're going to give you credit for the amount we didn't pay toward your health benefits, and that's going to count as part of your no, your, your honor. Would there's that be a, okay? There's no. That's a distinct difference. There's a, the, the defendants aren't even arguing that this is not that this is a benefit. This is not. Those are, would not be wages. It's a hypothetical. It's still. I understand, but it still has to be wages or salary. A payment in lieu and health of health insurance is not wages and salary. It's not direct payment for services personally rendered. What about um, deferred compensation? That's a benefit. Deferred compensation is included in the calculation of pension benefits. I'd be aware that I know that. Uh, I, I know that you know that. But that's a benefit. Honor. That's a that's a benefit. No, right? the Supreme Court of Arizona said that that was salary well, so, uh, so under the ASRS. Appeals. 
And this court also said that it was salary I do and that it that. was unambiguously yes. salary. Uh, the Supreme Court said, well, it might not be unambiguous, but it's still salary. And that's the Wade case. Well, you really the definition of salary set forth in, in the, was it Ward? Wade. Wade? Well, Wade was under the ASRS statute, Your Honor, but yes. It defines But the it word included salary. deferred compensation. These pay, the, the so state, the, there's the definition of salary in Wade, Supreme Court opinion, yes. tackles it, full paragraph. You agree with that definition? I don't disagree for ASRS purposes. For this purpose, I think it's a bit different. I, I'm not making it tethered, my inquiry, to any particular yes. document. Yes, we were the appellants in that case, Your Honor, which we in which we prevailed, this court said that deferred compensation was unambiguously included in the definition of salary under ASRS. Why? Because there were no exclusions and there were express exclusions in the statute and because it was regular payments made. Wages, on the other hand, don't have to be regularly paid to constitute wages and salary only has to be regularly paid uh, Usually these days, back when this statute was adopted, it was only in the more limited sense. So both of those terms are broad enough to encompass these payments. So, so let me, I, I just pulled up, Wade, uh, paragraph 14, and it defines salary as thus. Fixed compensation paid regularly. Yes, Your Honor. And, and, and you're on board with that? I was on board with that in that case under that statute, yes. But because but in those cases, not salary means something different in this case under this plan. Well, this statute, this statute includes wages and salary, and okay. wages cannot be so limited. There's nothing in wages that you could possibly attach to a requirement that it be regularly paid. So, but, but salary, though, you agree that we should really focus I on wages. I think the definition of salary says it's usually paid on a fixed basis. And in the Wade case, the plaintiffs were paid biweekly. So there was no question that that was sufficient to argue. Uh, in this case, it doesn't matter if you're paid biweekly, monthly, yearly, or not at all in a particular year, because the definitions are broad enough to encompass regular and not regular pay. And in fact, that's what happens right now. But wages. Wages. Right. But all of the employees of the city of Phoenix, as we pointed out in our brief, regardless of whether they receive a fixed salary, also get wages. All of their overtime and their vacation pay, et cetera, are calculated based on hours or days, not calculated based on an annual salary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I did want to reserve time for rebuttal, but perhaps the court will give me a little bit of lenience. Lean Thanks. <laughs> <clears throat> Sir. May it please the court, Eric Frazier on behalf of the city of Phoenix and the other appellees. I'd like to jump right into uh, the relevance of the city's past practice, and then I'd also like to address uh, Judge Weinzweig's comments about ASRS, because I'd like to point the court to um, the statute that's uh, in PSPRS. But in terms of the past practice, the past practice has no role in interpreting the city charter. This is not a statute. It's not in the city code. It's important to remember, as, as you commented earlier, Phoenix is a charter city which means that it is bound by the, by the charter in the same way that the state is bound by the Constitution. Courts do not mold their interpretation of the Constitution to account for the practices of the state government. Likewise, courts should not mold their interpretation of the charter to fit the practices of the city. It's an important distinction that this is not a statute. It's not in the city code. It's in the charter. Now, sometimes courts give deference to the government's interpretation of the law. But again, courts do not apply that kind of deference when interpreting the organic foundational documents approved by the voters in a charter or a city con yeah, or so constitution. Let me ask you, I may take you in a different direction. The city does not disagree that unused accrued vacation benefits are final average compensation. Can we agree on that? 
Well, unused, unused vacation. Accrued vacation. Used or un I'm sorry, used? Or, un un unused. 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 No, we, we do not agree with that. Unused vacation benefits are not included in final average compensation. So, so how do you explain the unused accrued vacation benefits paid out in the sellback program? So, yeah, I, I want to make an important distinction, well, are, which is why they, I... Are they, let's just get that down, are they accrued unused vacation benefits in the sellback program, and, and they're being included in the pension calculus? Is that accurate? Almost, and, and if I can just make a, a minor tweak to what you just said, the the money that is received when exchanging the unused accrued sick leave or vacation leave, that when it's sold back on a you know in, in an ordinary year, is included in in final average compensation. But again, whether our, our practice in, in 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 treating sellbacks as pensionable. <clears throat> Does not implicate how how the how the charter should be construed at all, but the sellbacks. The reason that those are included and the the one time cash outs are not, is because the sellbacks are available in an ordinary year. They're available throughout the employee's career, whereas the cash outs are available only once. Let's let's get this very clear. You would, I think, your position is that uh, compensation under the uh, sellback program is salary or wages? Yes. Okay. So let's take two uh, employees, all right? Uh, been working for 20 years, they reach their final year of employment. Uh, unfortunately, have not accrued an hour of, of vacation leave, but uh, a stroke of luck, in their last year, uh, they are able to accrue, let's say, 11 months of unused vacation leave. And so they, 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 they arrive at the precipice, the door of retirement. And as I understand it, they have two options to get compensated for that 11 month period. One is the sellback program and the other is the retirement program. Now your argument is that one is salary and wages and one is not. How is that defensible? Again, it's because eleven months. Go right. Ahead. It's it's because the the retirement cash out option is available only once in the entire career, whereas the sellbacks are available throughout the career. Why the city. That, why does that matter? I mean, what, what if what if the um, the contract of employment said, in your retirement year, you're going to get a big raise. It's going to be paid as salary, and it's going to be a 50% raise. But you only get it for one year because we can't afford to pay you that much forever. Is, is, is that any different? You know, I, I, don't, I don't know whether that would be treated as pensionable compensation. It might be. I and can't the, imagine how it wouldn't. Right. It, it, it very well might be. So what's the difference here? Isn't well, it the, simply arbitrary? I've got to ask you. Isn't it simply arbitrary as what, what you choose to declare as? appropriate it's not arbitrary what we choose to declare because we don't have that 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 power to decide right the city has has a, a has broad discretion in terms of how it pays its employees it can pay employees things like overtime things like a uniform allowance things like uh, health insurance premiums and and so you can pay the same money in all sorts of different ways through a sellback through a cash out but the gold standard that you have to measure those against when looking at whether something is pensionable is the charter, and the charter says annual salary or wages. Right. Salary right. and wages means. And the city means thinks that accrued vacation benefits, again, I'm not talking about whether it's 13 months or 11 months, which appears to be dispositive, uh, qualifies as salary or wages under the charter. Right, because they are, they are, they are annual, regular, periodic. And so there are all sorts of payments that might be annual, regular, or periodic. The city could make those same exact payments as a one-time retirement bonus. It could say, boy, instead of paying overtime every time you work more than 40 hours in a week, we'll just save those up and, and pay you all the overtime at once on your retirement day. What, then the same exact money would be pensionable as overtime, but if you pay it as a retirement bonus, is not because what, what it's only my, available my once. What about my hypothetical employee? Let's say he says, you know what, I'm going to go with the retirement, single retirement uh, uh, avenue, and that's how he gets compensated. Uh, it's 11 months. 
not 13 months. Uh, that's not final average. That's not salary or wages. Is that right. It? Because right, he right. took something that's only available once. It's a label that matters then? It's not a label. It's the character of the payments. It's whether they're available regularly, whether they're available in an, in an ordinary year. You that a, that a one-time, you know, final year goodbye raise would be pensionable. But that's a, that's a raise. I mean, if it were, if it were a, yeah, a retirement bonus on the last day, not that's... Not regular. It, it is by its terms restricted to a single short period of time. It is not regular, it is not continuous, and yet you say it's pensionable. So I think it depends on, on the, that's, I, I, I wouldn't give you a definite answer before because I think it depends on the facts of this, this raise. Does the raise last for a year? In which case, that's just a change to your pay rate. And the voters contemplated by saying salary or wages, your salary or wages might vary from year to year, which is why they take a three-year average. So it all, the, the voters already contemplated that the salary and wages might change from year to year. You might, as you rise up through the city, you might get a higher pay rate. And you're, you're giving kind of an extreme example, which is why I'm, I'm not exactly sure how that I, would be really, treated. Really, I'm just giving you this, the same example. I'm giving you the example in this case from an economic standpoint. I'm just changing the labels. And, and well, that seems to make a difference. It, it's, it's not the labels. It's, it's the substance, the character of the payments. Well, let's talk about that, the character, because as I see it, it's one thing. It's are we talking about 13 months or 11 months? That is your entire argument. That is why these benefits, which are otherwise salary or wages, aren't salary or wages in the context of the charter. The difference of 11, 13 months. It's not the difference of 11 or 13 months. It's when is the payment available? Is it something that employees can get continuously throughout their career? Right. So let's but say I, they can only get it every 13 months. Right. Right? That's not salary or wages. Right? Is it? Uh, I, uh, it, 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 it might not be. Uh, 11 months, if it's said, then it is salary or wages. If you could do it once a year, every 11 months, same exact benefit that salary or wages I, I think it is I think it is but I want to I want to say that our treatment of the sellbacks isn't shouldn't be dispositive in this case because maybe we're wrong about that right we were wrong about the the payments for unused sick leave which is a companion case pending in this court we were previously wrong about uh, cash outs for vacation leave uh, I, uh, our position is that sellbacks do count as annual salary or wages. That's not something the plaintiffs are challenging. Uh, but of course, maybe we're wrong about that. The, the key is that our treatment of these, our treatment of uh, particular elements of pay does not inform how you interpret the charter. It's the court's job to say what the law is. That's, that's Marbury versus Madison. Right, so which is pivoting back to your, your, your intro, which is what we do doesn't matter. Well, it, it, it might matter. Not, not for textual interpretation of the charter. And that's why cases like Cross said, okay, you can, you can correct uh, the mistake that you had made, you, but the court remanded for consideration of an equitable estoppel claim. Equitable estoppel and, and other legal doctrines might give the employees some rights against the city when they rely on the government's representations, which is why our snapshot approach uh, gives the employees everything that they had a right to up until the point at which the city recognized and corrected its mistake and brought the plan back into compliance right. with I the I guess charter. my point is, if, if you're saying, you know what, we might have this wrong, this, um, this payback program, and um, you know, I I again, what, what we're doing uh, can't change the, the terms, the ink uh, that appears uh, in the charter. Right. That's right. Okay. So I, I want to I turn very briefly to a point you were discussing earlier, Judge Weinzweig, um, concerning ASRS and the amendment to ASRS in 1984. Uh, it, it looks like you found the previous version, which, which specifically included irregular payments, which is why ASRS had to be amended in order to exclude the one-time cash outs. The same is true with PSPRS. PSPRS before the 1984 amendment uh, included anything reported on an employee's W-2, 
which would include all sorts of stuff that's not salary or wages. That's, uh, I can point you to the citation, it's Laws 1983, Chapter 300, page 1131. <coughs> so both ASRS and PSPRS, in order to exclude the one-time payouts, had to be amended. Whereas the charter here did not have to be amended to exclude the one-time payouts because they didn't have those really broad definitions. The charter didn't say previously, we'll include everything that's on your W-2. It seems like that was the city's practice for, for many years, uh, but that's not what was in, in the charter. So um, I also like to turn to, to Judge Swan's hypothetical about a whole career's worth of vacation leave that, it, that, that gets paid out. That's actually what's at issue, essentially, in the companion case that's pending in this court, the Pacholi case, which addressed sick leave. Sick leave you can accumulate over a much longer period of time and then pay it out right here. So I think, I think what you might have intended to be kind of an absurd hypothetical is actually pending in the court and, and is a very real consequence of, of, uh, of reversing the, this trial court in this case. Now, Again, turning to the point of, of deference, because I think the plaintiff's arguments largely turn on deference to the city's past practice. Courts do sometimes not only give deference to a legal interpretation, and I explained why that doesn't make sense when it's a, a charter you're talking about. It also doesn't make sense when um, the government has, has explained that it's a mistake and there's no evidence that it was the, the practice was the result of a deliberate considerate consideration, um, a deliberate analytical process, reasoned decision making. There's no evidence that it was any of those things. Let me ask you. So, so let's go back to to the point that um, uh, we don't look at the administrative. Uh, you know, you might have it wrong. Does the fact you might have it wrong mean it's possibly ambiguous? No. No, you, you, people frequently misinterpret a statute or a constitutional provision. Based upon what, counsel? That's clear. Excuse me? Based upon what? It's, if it's not because it's ambiguous, what do they misinterpret it based upon? It's that they, they didn't, they didn't interpret it at all. So the city, the city didn't, didn't engage in any kind of deliberate process to interpret the term of the charter. So, so you're telling me that with Piccioli, uh, in the backdrop, uh, and a, an affirmative, um, I, I think, thoughtful, I would think, uh, decision to continue forward with the payback program, that that's un, unthinking, that, that, that we're not supposed to, that, that, that doesn't indicate ambiguity, that indicates busy people who haven't had a chance to tackle a tough issue. Oh, you mean because vacation leave was, was corrected two years later? Is that, what, is that what you're referring to? Sick leave was corrected in 2012. Vacation leave was corrected in 2014. I'm not, I'm not trying to no, tell you. No, no. So I'm saying today we have the payback program, right? R right, the sellback program. And, uh, sellback, sorry. And, um, and we were sort of saying that, you know, that might be wrong. And, and if it's wrong, that doesn't matter necessarily to the terms of the charter. So my question to you is only, given the mistake, uh, could we look at that as probative evidence uh, or, or certainly moving the needle uh, in the direction of ambiguity? That if you're continuing to get something wrong in the face of um, incredibly uh, time uh, and resource intensive litigation, does that indicate some ambiguity? Right. I, I think I understand your question now. And I have a couple of responses to that. First of all, our position is not that we're wrong on the sellback. It's, it, we think the sellbacks do qualify as salary or wages. But if we are wrong, that doesn't necessarily mean it's ambiguous because people misinterpret statutes all the time. The statutory interpretation and, and interpreting something like the charter or a constitution, you, <clears throat> you look at the, the text, you look at definitions, you use all of your tools of construction and you do the best you can. If you get it wrong, it doesn't mean that it's ambiguous. Don't use tools of construction at all when it's unambiguous, right? You're forbidden to. When it's unambiguous? Yeah. No, you, you use the tools of construction to determine what it means. And if you can use those tools of construction and arrive at a result, then it's not ambiguous. I, I, think, I think we may have uh, I've read different treatises on interpretation. When, when language is unambiguous, construction is unnecessary and inappropriate when we may use term, we may use 
construction tools all the time, but that's that's really to resolve ambiguities, not to find their absence. I think even the the strictest uh, textualists use dictionaries to determine the unambiguous meaning. You're trying to determine what what does this this word or phrase mean. You look to a dictionary. You don't look to other sources of extrinsic evidence like the legislative history, the use, things like that. But you do use dictionaries to look at what the terms mean. Where of strict anything, but I think that the um use of a dictionary is not a construction technique, right? You're looking at the plain language of the words. And if the plain language of the words re leads reasonable people to different conclusions over decades, maybe it's not that plain. We disagree because, again, over decades, there's no evidence that anybody was looking at this or thinking of it. But again, a ambiguity does not mean that you just look to the past practice. If it's ambiguous, if the Constitution is ambiguous, you don't look to what the government has been doing in, say, the First Amendment or the Fourth Amendment. Do you the, it's the court's job to ambiguous? Construe. Absolutely not. Because, like I just said, if, if, the, if the Second Amendment is ambiguous or the Fourth Amendment is ambiguous, you don't look to what the government has been doing to resolve that ambiguity. Don't, the, if you don't lose if it's ambiguous, why are you so cl clinging so hard to... to the lack of ambiguity. I don't think we are clinging so hard to the lack of ambiguity. We've been talking We're about saying it for the last five minutes, right? Because the the principal argument advanced by the plaintiffs is that you have to resolve the ambiguity by looking at the past practice. Our position is no, you don't have to look at the past practice, even if it's ambiguous. That's that's Marbury versus Madison. It's the court's right. job to say what the law if is. If it's ambiguous, you use terms of of textual construction. Uh, you would agree with that, right? If it's ambiguous, use tools of textual construction. Yes. Okay. And and what tools of textual construction lead you, assuming ambiguity now, to the position you're asserting? It, it's it's the same tools of construction, which is the dictionaries. Which is why, in our position, it doesn't really matter whether it's ambiguous or not, because you use the same tools, the same dictionaries in either case, and I think reach the same result. Right. You got nothing else other than the dictionary. It, it well we have we have other other courts that have reached this result like like Cross v Eorp and International Association of Firefighters from the Kansas Supreme Court Craig versus City of Huntington Stover versus the Retirement Board of, of St Clair Shores all those cases interpreted salary or wages and excluded the one time cash outs of accrued either vacation leave or sick leave so th these courts are nearly un unanimous on this right Cross. Uh, Cross said that legal authorities have concluded that salary does not include bonuses or other amounts not paid at regular intervals. What about wages? Same thing with wages, right? The, wage, the dictionary definition of wages has the same concepts of regular periodic payments. But wouldn't you agree that if, if an employee uh, foregoes vacation and the city does nothing to compensate them for that, that they might actually have a valid wage claim under Arizona law? Yes, but what we're what we're dealing with here is 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 the how you treat the cash. The, the employees still do receive the cash out when they retire. If they have unused accrued sick or a vacation leave, the city still pays them that cash out. And that's All, a wage. No, that's not a wage. It's not a wage because it, again, it's it's the it's the one time cash out. If the if the city didn't cash it out, and the employee bought an action under Title 23, would that not be an action for wages under Arizona law? I don't know. I don't know whether it would be. Again, the, the Wage Act, things like the Wage Act define wages broadly because the purpose there is to make sure, as you were saying, that every penny that's owed from the employer to the employee gets paid. You want to make sure that every penny gets paid. In the pension context, you don't get a pension for every single penny that, you're, that, that the employer pays you. Your examples of reimbursements, of health care premiums. If your employer doesn't give you the promised, or doesn't pay your health insurance that they promised, you could sue them for that, but that's not included in your, in your pensionable compensation. I think you're out of time. Thanks, Council. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I'd ask that the bailiff put two minutes on the appellant's uh, clock. Thank you very much. We just hate to quit arguing, you know what I mean? Yeah. Council, I if you would. I appreciate it. Thank you. I just want to stress a few things that seem to be uh, confusing by uh, opposing counsel. One is that these are not retirement payouts. They're paid out whether you've worked a week, a, a month, a year. 
you don't have to be retirement eligible to receive your uh, vacation, accrued vacation payout at, at termination of employment. It's paid at termination of employment. So there's nothing about a post-retirement payment. Secondly, we, we cited the Morash case in our in our, in our brief, that's a United States Supreme Court case that stresses that uh, deferred vacation does not lose its character as compensation merely because it's deferred. If it was wages when it was earned, it's wages when it's paid. Counsel, um, let me ask you, the sellback yes. program, yes. how many opportunities are there a year to um, participate in that program? For most employees, there are two opportunities a year. For some employees, I believe it's only once a year. But uh, there's a chart in, in the um, AR that's in our papers that shows that it's either uh, May and November for most employees. But I believe that there are some executives that only get it once a year. So, but in your mind, the, the fact that you can um, tap that program with such frequency, six months, versus uh, another program where you have to wait possibly 30 years. No, it's... Uh, the, 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 quali the quantitative difference of those two is irrelevant in your uh, mind uh, to the definition of salary and wages. Yes, Your Honor. I don't think, first of all, it's one program. It's, uh, it's a continuum. You can get your sell back every year annually, and when you leave employment, whether you're uh, 30 well, it's years one or program, one year. Right? You, you, the retirement... No. Payout is one you get it's separation. I mean, what? No, if that's the, not one the vacation. Program, the vacation payout. We'll get to that in a second. But you, you would agree with me that the retirement payout, that's that's a, a, a one-time deal. That's the sick leave pay case you're talking about, then, because vacation payout is not retirement. Connected. Right. No, but there continues to be, and I, I thought an accrued vacation payout you can get at separation for up to 2.5 years. That was what used, that's the, that's the rule that we're suing about. They, uh, the city did away with that rule. Well, let me ask you, can, can I interject here sure. for a moment? 2.5 years. Right. If the employees wanted to sue saying that was arbitrary and capricious and it should be extended to 10 years, would they have a claim? No, Your Honor. Why? No, because that's a, those benefits are negotiated. Uh, the point six. What? What about two point six? I no, mean, the, it, we're the, not. The yeah. What makes arbitrary this, flexibility here troubles me. Okay, but we're make, we're drawing a distinction, Your Honor, between pension benefits. This is about a pension formula. It's not about how much vacation pay you get to get paid out. The lower court confused vesting of vacation benefits with vesting of a pension formula. Our position in this case is regardless of of uh, the, if it's 2.6 or 2.1, if you are paid uh, termina uh, vacation benefits on termination, and those are your highest years, that's entitled to be included in the pension formula, which brings this case into Yazelle. It's the difference between a pension formula that vests on the first day of employment and other types of benefits that this court has recognized may have contractual article, you know, the well, contract the clause rights. That, that, that you're concerned about, right? I mean, re really, that's the critical point here because we have a year uh, currently that you can still uh, inject into the uh, the formula. Well, you you can carry two and a half years in your Is last year of employment. A year you Honor. can still use of accrued benefits. You can use that in the formula. That's correct. Okay. And what the, the, what the issue is, your client has, is that the 2.5 years uh, is not still still in the game. So, so that is the difference between one year and 2.5 years. That's, that's everything. Well, the, ca the um, cash out is, is 80 hours a year. You can cash out up to 80 hours a year. Uh, at termination, you can cash out uh, two and a half hours. Um, I just, I think the vesting issue here is important and the, and the lower court misunderstood it. It's vesting of rights to have any, any wages or salary included in the formula for calculating benefits, whether it's vacation pay, overtime, a one-time performance pay, all of those payments, if they are salary or wages, belong in the calculation. All right. Thank Counselor, you. you've got a very long two minutes. I, I agree. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you for your input and your consideration of our questions today.
We're going to take it under advisement at this time, and we will issue our decision in due course. We're adjourned.